just going to do a quick review. So we talked about how if two events take place at the same point in an inertial frame S, an observer in a frame S prime moving relative to S observes a time interval between these events that is greater than in S by the Lorenz factor. And this factor is substantially different from one only if the relative speed of S prime and S is a substantial fraction of the speed of light. However, there's this question about who is moving in whom's frame that looks like kind of a paradox. Because if I'm moving at some relative velocity, I can't say if I'm the one who's moving or another person who in my frame is not moving, is not moving or vice versa. That's the whole point of relativity. That's why when we looked at the length contraction and we said, okay, if, 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 I, if I'm moving and I see the other person as length contracted, what do they see? Well, they also see me as length contracted. But then we've got this paradox involving time because it turns out that time has an irreversibility to it. So there's this sort of like hand wavy argument for the twin paradox. And I'm, I say it's hand wavy because it does a pretty good job of answering the question, but I think the fundamental answer about the nature of time has yet to be fully explained by physics. I mean, when you hear about why does time, the laws of physics work equally well forwards and backwards in time, but there's an asymmetry there because when we have an actual physical process going, there are processes that simply only go in one direction in time. And usually we have to go into another branch of physics to explain that. We usually have to jump into StatMech and start talking about entropy and how we have irreversibility associated with physical processes and the irreversibility defines an arrow of time. However, does it really? I mean, yes, it does, but what's the exact connection between entropy and time? We don't have a nice simple equation for that, and there probably ultimately needs to be one somehow, but we don't have that yet. But anyway, just to get into this uh, twin paradox, think about it from the perspective of, it starts with the paradox that if, if somebody moves really fast up by, um, and close to the speed of light, and a twin stays on Earth and doesn't move at all, the person who's traveling they're, they're not gonna be aging as much, right? They're gonna, their process of aging is gonna be different. But then when they come back to Earth, who can say who was the one moving? Because the person who was on Earth could just say that from the perspective of the twin who's moving but doesn't know they're moving, they can say, but I thought you moved away from me. So why did only one of the twins age? And why did, and why did the age, uh, like say the twin goes so close to the speed of light that they basically don't age at all. And then they come back. The other twin could equally well say, well, well, I, I saw you fly away at this speed and that's why you didn't age. But then the twin could say, but I saw you fly away. I was just going at some constant velocity the whole time. So there's this paradox. Why is, there, why is it actually observable that there's a difference between the two twins frames of reference when relativity says by definition there shouldn't be. So it has to do with acceleration. So for the twin to come back, there had to have been some acceleration involved, which changes things up a little bit. So just to sort of give it to you in the... <clears throat> so these equations for time dilation, uh, and I'll just put these out on the board here. So we've got Delta T equals gamma, delta T naught, where we remember gamma is one over square root one minus one minus V squared over C squared. Okay, that's our gamma factor. And then they used U for the relative velocity, which is fine. I can switch to U.
for that. Just know that it's the relative velocity, v1 minus, v2 minus v1. If the first person is not moving at all, then v1 is just zero then. That's been most of the cases we've looked at. And then we've got delta t then is, turns into that. So consider identical twin astronauts named Eartha and Astrid. Eartha remains on Earth while her twin Astrid takes off on a high-speed trip through the galaxy. Because of time dilation, Eartha observes Astrid's heartbeat and all other life processes proceeding more slowly than her own. Thus to Eartha, Astrid ages more slowly. When Astrid returns to Earth, she is younger, has aged less than Eartha. But all inertial frames are equivalent. Can't Astrid make exactly the same arguments to conclude that Eartha is younger? Couldn't she say that? Because who can say who's moving? With the train example that we did, when the person's on the train moving and the other person is on the ground, the person on the train doesn't know they're moving. They could think the, the whole ground and everything that, that's passing them is what's moving. And they can make that argument and it's valid because both frames are inertial. Neither one is accelerating. Um, so that's the paradox. Uh, each twin, then each twin measures the other to be when they're ba when they're uh, back together, and that's a paradox because that can't be. So to resolve the paradox, note that the twins are not identical in all respects. While Eartha remains in approximately inertial frame at all times. Astrid must accelerate with respect to that time frame during parts of her trip in order to leave, turn around, and return to Earth. Eartha's reference frame is always approximately inertial. Astrid's is often far from inertial. Thus, there's a real physical difference between the circumstances of the two twins. Careful analysis shows that Eartha is correct. When Astrid returns, she is younger than Eartha. Okay, so that question didn't answer anything. They just said, okay, you know what? It's different because she accelerated, so her reference frame wasn't inertial, therefore, that's the reasoning behind it. But does that explain why she aged differently? No, it doesn't. So here's my explanation for it. And this is, this is not in your textbook, and it's a little bit like, I'm not going to say it's different than, it's, it is physics, but it's like, it's going to involve, so anyway, there's a, there's a quantum relationship between time and energy. And the, there's canonical conjugates in uh, quantum mechanics. Position and momentum are canonical conjugates. And that means that they're related in a geometrical way, in a quantum sense, and what I'm talking about with quantum stuff is we move from a coordinate space where we just talk about position to a coordinate space where we have to talk about position and momentum at the same time, a phase space. And so because there's an uncertainty between position and momentum, I make, in other words, I have an ambiguity there where there's a certain uncertainty with how much position and momentum I have. There's a relationship there then. But there's a relationship quantum mechanically at the fundamental level that extends to classical physics. So what am I talking about here? Okay, so a change, what is, what is position and what is momentum? How are the two related to each other? Let's think about it loosely. When I have momentum, I have basically a velocity, a mass and a velocity. Well, what's a velocity? It's a change, it's a type of, change of position. So I could say that momentum and position are canonical conjugates, and mathematically, they're connected to each other because if I have my momentum, my momentum gives a change in position, okay? If I, if I do that same kind of reasoning for energy and time, which are also canonical conjugates, I could say that a, an energy corresponds to a change in time. So remember, in order to give something energy, you basically have to accelerate it. So we could say that the, the change in time that this twin 
the, the, the change in time associated with this process can be attributed to the acceleration that the twin undergoes and the energy transfer that occurs. And that's also ties in with entropy because entropy typically involves processes that have an energy transfer essentially to it as well. But anyway, without, I can't go into any more details about that because it would take up too much time, but that's a slightly more better explanation than the book, I think. As long as we have um, a perceivable frame where there was acceleration that occurred at any point, the two frames are not perfectly symmetrical. And acceleration ruins the symmetry and we can pick out which inertial observer stayed inertial and which inertial observer had an acceleration. And we can pinpoint that by how the passage of time was different for the two observers, which makes a perceivable difference. Yes. Yes. Because the passage of time is different for the, the, the twin moving faster. So the clock ticks slower, right? Or the clock ticks at a different rates for which, for which person. Let's think about that. So let's go back and let's make sure we, we get we understand this. So, um, so the twin, the twin on um, let's see, the twin on Earth. Okay, yeah, you can talk about this for a second. The twin on Earth observes that Astrid's heartbeats are proceeding more slowly than her own. So for Eartha, the passage of time for the other twin who's going faster is ticking slower. It is a slower passage of time. So as a certain amount of time elapses in, in her frame, that same amount of time has not elapsed in Astrid's frame. Okay, does that make sense? And then the fact that the two can't make the exact same argument it's because she has to turn she has to decelerate and turn back around again and so that deceleration process is what breaks the symmetry because there she's not an inertial observer during that process so there's there's a link there then between what is uh the passage of time and acceleration for inertial observers but not, it's not exactly the passage of time because the, the passage of time is affected by the Lorenz factor. So we can't say that, the, um, that it's necessarily the acceleration is what causes the passage of time. It's a little bit like more ambiguous than that. However, the two observers can be differentiated because one of them did not stay inertial the whole time. If they both stayed inertial, then they could never go back and compare clocks. And I know that's kind of a cheat in a way. I feel like that's not complete, but that's the explanation we have up to this point. Yes. So, do you think that the property of Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So, so yes. So, we would have to we'd have to start the process before uh, we'd have to assume that she accelerates before Astrid starts observing to get around that, and then she flies past at constant uh, velocity, and we start the clocks at the same time. Then the passage of time differs. She makes the observation, and then yes, both observers could notice when she decelerates during that time and comes back. That change, that deceleration could be measured by both. And it would be felt essentially as a kind of a force, right? Because we have this mass times acceleration as a force. So there would be a relativistic force uh, exerted when this ship is decelerating to zero and coming back the other direction. Yes. And that could be determined. That could be determined by both observers. Yes. So, with the two observers, you're 
Yes. That's a great question. So with radial motion, we can always determine which object is in is going because radial motion always involves acceleration. There is, and that's why that's why the special theory of relativity does not apply to gravitational systems because in a gravitational system we always have a uh, an acceleration occurring. Like when we're we're accelerating constantly on Earth because we're going around the uh, sun in a different sense than the gravitational acceleration caused by just gravity itself from us being attracted to all the other mass on the earth. That's a different kind of acceleration. But when you're in orbit and, and you're doing a radial trajectory, you're not in an inertial frame of reference. If you're rotating, you're not in an inertial reference frame because that's an acceleration, a change in direction alone, even if you're at constant velocity, if you're changing direction, then you are accelerating and you're not an inertial observer. Does that make sense? Okay, great. All right, so that's the twin paradox. Um, and I think we, we already derived relativity of length, right? Yeah. So we can just kind of go past this. But I think we were to the point now where we wanted to do some examples. So let's do, um, let's do an example. Oh yeah, we did lengths perpendicular to the relative motion too, and we showed that that does not cause a length contraction. So remember, lengths perpendicular to the relative motion do not undergo any kind of length contraction. Okay, this is one we didn't do. A spaceship flies past Earth at a speed of 0.99 C. A crew member on board the spaceship measures its length, obtaining the value of 400 meters. What length do observers measure on Earth? Okay, so let's do, pull out a sheet of paper, let's try to work this one really quick. So we've got this um, spaceship here flying past Earth. Make it look like a fish or something. I don't know. It does some kind of crazy thing where its uh, length contracts and it flies past Earth. It's going at 0.99 C. That's my U. Um, and a crew member on board the spaceship measures its length and they see that it's 400 meters. So on the ship, in their frame of reference, the ship is 400 meters. But what about somebody on Earth all the way out here? I want to make that. I don't have any blue chalk. Yes, I do. Let's, let's say we have somebody on Earth. just looks like a blue orb, essentially, when you're far enough away from it in space. Blue glowing orb. Because the water is so much more, water and clouds, so much more than anything else. Okay, so somebody on Earth, what do they see this length as? So we're going to use length contraction here to find out. So we have our U, it's 0.99C, and then we have our length contraction formula that we derived last class. So we have that the length is equal to the proper length, L0, times this 1 minus, root 1 minus U squared over C squared. So we have 1 over the Lorentz factor that multiplies this out. So um, does that make sense where, how this came about? What is L0? L0 is the 400 meters. So 
L0 could be kind of analogous to proper time. It's proper length. So during this whole process, the observers on board the ship, they, they think they're at rest. Okay. They think they're at rest and they don't realize that they're moving. They think the earth is flying past them. So we're gonna treat their frame of reference as the proper length one. And then we've got this, so then the length that the observers observe on Earth, L, is gonna be this L0 times root one minus u squared over c squared. And then L0 is 400. So we have 400 times this factor of root one minus 0.99c, the c's cancel. So we just have it like that. And then that gives us a length of only 54 uh, point or 56.4 meters. So here's an interesting thing. What would the length of the ship be if it moved at the speed of light? Zero. But then, wait a second, what is the length of a photon? Because we know that light, what's the length of a light wave then? Because the, a, a light wave travels at the speed of light and it has a, presumably some length associated with it. So what is, so what's the, what's the length of a radio wave, we, we know it, it has a length to it. It's got like, a radio wave is like a couple of meters. A microwave is like a couple of centimeters. What's the, um, does that mean that this is not applied to light? Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't apply to light, but shouldn't it? It's something to think about. So there's, there's still some questions that are unanswered by this, but all I can tell you for, for this particular section is it doesn't apply to light. It applies to any object that has mass that's moving relative to another object. Because if you did plug in the speed of light for the relative velocity, you're gonna get zero length because that just becomes one and it's just zero times whatever length it is in the reference frame of it. Um, but there's one little workaround for why it doesn't work for light. Can you guess why it doesn't work for light? I could, I could like, why do you think it doesn't work for light? Somebody, somebody here is, who's a physics junkie who reads about this kind of stuff a little bit. Why doesn't it work for light? Why does it give us a nonsense answer? Yes. It, because of the mass, yes. But what's special about an object that has mass that's different from objects that don't have mass. What does an object with mass have that an object that's massless doesn't have? That's a, no, but light does have momentum. Oh. Yeah, so, so that doesn't fix it. It's a little bit more abstract, than, abstract property than momentum. What is it? It's a frame of reference that's at rest. Light has no rest frame. There's always a special frame of reference that the object with mass can be transformed to that's a rest frame. Remember, we said that, that every object in relativity that's, that, that's like, has, a, has one frame of reference that's at rest and then an infinite number of others that are at varying velocities, any continuum of velocities. With light, it has only one rest frame, but it's not at rest. Or no, not at rest frame. It has only one frame, but it's not at rest. It's moving at the speed of light. So that's the reason these formulas don't work because it doesn't occupy the same geometrical position in space-time as a massive object. It lies in a different region that this equation does not apply to. It's like a region of a map that light doesn't belong on. A space-time diagram you could think of 
like uh, the light cone, okay? So we have like CT, and we've got some object moving less than the speed of light. It has to travel anywhere inside this light cone, but the light travels on the cone. These equations with length contraction, they don't apply to objects traveling on this cone. This is a special geometrical region where this algebraic relation does not hold. So to, to finally stress this final point, light has no rest frame, therefore this equation does not apply to it. Okay, great. So then um, the spaceship is shorter in a frame in which it is in motion than in a frame in which it is rest. To measure the length L, two Earth observers with synchronized clocks could measure the positions of the two ends of the spaceship simultaneously in the Earth's reference frame. And these two measurements will not appear simultaneous to an observer in the spaceship. Okay, that's weird. Let's read that one again, because that's weird. So, the spaceship is shorter in a frame in which it is in motion than in which it is at rest. So in Earth's frame, it appears shorter than it does in its rest frame, where the people on the ship, they're like, this thing's 400 meters. The people on Earth are like, no, it's not, it's 56.4. Okay, that part we know. But then to measure the length L, two Earth observers with synchronized clocks could measure the positions of both ends. So in other words, the person, the person sh finds, shoots a beam of light, hits it here, and then a person at another point on Earth shines a beam of light, hits it here, and they measure the two uh, ends of the ship as it flies past um, simultaneously in Earth's reference frame. So they say, okay, we're gonna measure, we're gonna measure this, this spaceship and it's going to be um, at the same time. So we shoot the, we shoot the rays of light. We're, we agree that these light rays hit the spaceship at the same time. But the spaceship says, no, they don't. Why is that? Why is it, why is it not, why are these two measurements not simultaneous to the observers on the spaceship? Why is that? Because the light, the, to make the measurement, they have to use a beam of light. They have to use something that has a velocity that's gonna strike the ship, but the ship is moving while this happens. So it's gonna encounter one of these beams before it count encounters the other. This beam that's going to the tail end has to catch up to it to go the different, to, 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 to get to the end while this, while this uh, beam, it runs into it sooner. So the two, the, the two um, light beams do not hit the ship at the same time in the reference frame of the observers on the ship. Thus, we have a relativity of simultaneity. Simultaneity, an event that was simultaneous for, for these observers on Earth. The measurement of the length of the ship happens at the same time in their frame of reference. It is not simultaneously uh, happening for the observers on this ship. Does that make sense? It's kind of like that example with the train that we did with the lightning strike last time. Same idea here. And that's the reason for that. So light having a finite constant speed is what affects the simultaneity of events and making events not simultaneous for certain observers, where they are for other observers. Okay, any questions about that? points. Okay. So, because of this length contraction, the dimensions of an object depend on the frame of reference of the observer. If an object is moving at constant velocity relative to your inertial frame, its length is contracted along the direction of relative motion. There's no change in length perpendicular to the direction of the relative motion. Thus, the volume of something is going to be relative. Yes. It does. It makes the volume and area of an object relative to the frame of reference. So the observers on this ship may measure the, they won't, the ship won't be the same shape either. It could be squished. It's gonna be, it's gonna be the same height in both frame of references, but it's gonna be shorter in 
this frame of reference, so it's gonna look squished. Okay, now let's do another example. Observers O1 and O2 are 56.4 meters apart on Earth. Okay, so we've got some piece of land here on Earth. Got like a little bit of Antarctica, a little bit of South America. This would be like the United States up here. Then into Canada, a little bit of Alaska. All right, I'm not gonna take too much time to draw this out. But basically we've got this point on Earth and then we've got these two observers some distance apart on Earth here. I know you can't really see that, but there's a little orange line denoting that distance. Let's say that that orange line is 56.4 meters apart on Earth. So two observers on Earth, they're 56.4 meters apart. Delta X is 56.4 meters. Um, how far apart does the spaceship crew measure them to be? So now the spaceship crew is, is measuring, making the measurement. So they're simultaneously measuring, they're shooting a beam of light back this way. So they could, they could have a, a crew member who shoots a beam of light to here and another one another beam of light to there. How far does that measurement look for them? So now what becomes the proper length? The proper length becomes this 56.4 meters. Because remember, this spaceship is not accelerating. So it's just as correct to say that Earth, for them, that Earth flies away at 0.99 the speed of light in their frame of reference. So we just apply the length formula in the opposite sense. We have L is equal to 56.4 meters times one minus 0.99 squared. And then that gives us a shortened distance of 7.96 meters. So the entirety of Earth in this frame of reference looks squished. When they fly past Earth and they look at it at this speed, they're gonna see Earth looking like, it's gonna be the same height, but it's gonna be squished. And so all the distance points on the Earth itself are going to look closer together because of this squishing effect, because of the relativistic. Earth and then Earth as seen from space ship. There we go. So these two points, they, they go inwards. They get way closer together because the squishing goes that direction. No change in the perpendicular distance though, only this way. Okay, so this answer does not say that the crew measures their spaceship to be both 400 meters long and 7.96 meters long. As measured on Earth, the tail of the spacecraft is at the position 01 at the same instant that the nose of the spacecraft is at the position of O2. Hence, the length of the spaceship measured on Earth equals 56.4 meters distance between O1 and O2. But in the spaceship frame, O1 and O2 are only 7.96 meters apart, and the nose, which is 400 meters in front of the tail, passes O2 before the tail passes O1. Okay, so that's kind of weird. And that sort of reminds me of this other thing we're not gonna talk about, which is the barn paradox. Um, but basically, so you have to think about the fact that this relativity of, of events, simultaneity, 
comes into play here when we talk about this length measurement again. It doesn't say that the crew measures their spaceship to be both 400 meters long and 7.96 meters long. Um, what it says is that, um, and I think that they made a mistake here because the 7.96 meters, that applies to this distance on Earth. But what we're, what we're saying, I think what they're trying to say here is it should be 400 meters long and 56.4 meters long, right? That's what, that's what I think they're trying to say here. Because basically, um, well, let's see. Okay, so the tail of the spacecraft is at position 01 at the same instant the nose of the spacecraft is at position of 02. Okay, so as measured on Earth, the spacecraft is at the position 01 at the same time that the nose of the spacecraft is at position of 02. So the length of the spaceship measured on Earth equals 56.4 meters distance between 01 and 02, which we found here from the first example. But in the spaceship frame, 01 and 02 are only 7.96 meters apart. Oh, okay, I see what they're saying here. Never mind, yeah. So the 56.4 becomes the um, distance between there. So they chose this, they chose this distance for a reason. So they choose, they choose observers to be exactly 56.4 meters apart, which is the length that the spaceship looks shortened to, to an observer on Earth. So that's why they choose that 56.4, because they, remember, we found that on Earth, the spacecraft looks like it's only 56.4 meters away. So then what they do in part two is they say, okay, what about two observers who are the same length away as what they measure the shortened spaceship to be? How far do they look on Earth? How far away, or how, um, which, how much distance away do they look to the spaceship? Even more shortened. But the resolution to this paradox where it seems to imply that it could be both 400 meters long and only 7.96 is that the timing is different for the two measurements. So as measured on Earth, the tail of the spacecraft is at 01 at the same instant that the nose of the spacecraft is at position of 02. So the length of the spaceship on Earth equals the 56.4 distance between 01 and 02. But that's for Earth. For, for Earth, they measure that for this point. But then in the spaceship frame, 01 and 02, are only 7.96 meters apart. So um, what, they, what they're saying is, we could actually have these, the measurements of the spacecraft made by two observers, one here and one here, and they're 56.4 meters apart on Earth. So they make the measurement, and in their frame of reference, where they're, where they're standing 56.4 meters away from each other, they measure the spaceship to be at the same distance, uh, to be 56.4 meters uh, long when they're when it's actually in their rest frame 400 meters. So they measure they're 56.4 meters apart. They measure a spaceship to be 56.4 meters. The spaceship flies past and measures their distance to only be 7.96 meters. What's the resolution to that? Why do they make those two? Uh, differing measurements. Why don't they agree? Because the, as measured on Earth, the tail of the spacecraft is at position 01 at the same instant the nose is at 02. So the length of the spaceship on Earth does equal that 56.4 meter distance between 01 and 02. But in the spaceship frame, 01 and 02, which is, let me mark this. This is 01 here on Earth. And this is O2, also here on Earth. In the spacecraft frame, when they're flying past, they look at those same points, and O1 and O2 are only 7.96 meters apart, and the nose, which is 400 meters in front of the tail, passes O2 before the tail passes O1. So O2 and O1 are not passed at the same point. So they're not, the events 
that occurs between them is not simultaneous. Okay, kind of weird, but that's the resolution to that. Okay, any questions about this one? No? Okay. Okay, so let's think a little bit about the visual appearance of a moving three-dimensional object. If we could think the positions of all points of the object simultaneously, it would appear to shrink only in the direction of motion, but we don't see all the points simultaneously. Light from points further from us take longer to reach us than does light from points near to us. So we see the further points as the positions they had at earlier times. So that's the idea about when we look into space and we see back in time, because the light that we're seeing now from, from galaxies, it took so many light years for it to travel to us. So we're seeing distant objects, not as they appear now, but as they appeared millions, even billions of years ago with these telescopes. And that's the idea that is communicated here. Okay. Suppose we had a rectangular rod with its faces parallel to the coordinate planes. When we look on either at the, either the center of the closest face of such a rod at rest, we see only that face. We see the center rod and computer generated uh, figure here. Okay, so this is the example. So we're looking at this rod and we're seeing how it looks when it's moving at different velocities. So you can see this idea that the volume and the shape of an object changes as it moves faster. You can see that its angle even, it looks like it's moving at a different angle even though it's not. Both of these figures, it's moving to the right, but it's not, it didn't rotate. It's just moving to the right at different velocities, but it looks rotating because the angles and the, the shapes of the volume that define the volume of this, of this rod are relative and changing. So it looks like there's a rotation occurring when there's not. And it ignores the color change that would occur due to the Doppler shift. So we're just looking at how the shape changes. So that's the idea of this volume change that occurs when we have um, relativistic velocities and it changes the volume. Okay, let's do a quick 10 minute break and then when we get back, we're gonna do the Lorentz transformations. a second here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the uh, Lorenz transformations. What is this doing? Okay, so we discussed the Galilean coordinate transformation equations. Um, they just relate the coordinates x, y, z of a point and frame of reference to coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime. Um, and they were really simple. They were just like, um, you know, x, t is equal to t prime. Basically, you could summarize them as this. t equals t prime, that's Galilean transformation in a nutshell. Then there's one for x, right? Uh, so v, v prime is equal to, like, say, v plus whatever relative velocity I have the two frames moving at. Okay, so um, now we're ready to talk about um, the second frame. Okay, sorry. Now we're ready to talk about the um, Lorenz transformations. So our first question is this. When an event occurs at point X, Y, Z at time T, what are the coordinates x prime, y prime, z prime, and t prime of the event as observed in the second frame? Okay, so let's, let's write this out properly, the way that a physicist would do if they were doing a physics problem involving relativistic speeds, which is done all the time at particle accelerators where we do have particles moving at relativistic speeds and relativistic physics holds. So, we're gonna call um, S, we're gonna say S has coordinates X, Y, Z, and T. And then we're gonna say S prime has coordinates X prime, Y prime, Z prime, and T prime. 
So notice that I put my time coordinate as part of space. What that means is that I can draw a special kind of a vector, two special kinds of vectors, one that represents S and one that represents S prime. Because remember, remember from magnetism, position is a vector, right? What is the position vector in magnetism? Well, it's, uh, remember, it's a vector that points from our origin to the location of, say, a charge, Q. That's a position vector. And we could say that the charge is located at x, y, z. Maybe it only has an x and a y component and z is zero, whatever. That's the idea for, for uh, a normal position vector. But now we have an extra one. If this charge is moving at relativistic velocities, which we have all the time, we have um, electrons going at close to the speed of light, we need to add an additional coordinate, t. And then remember that if we have a coordinate axis that has x, y, and z on it, we can rotate that axis and we can turn x into y. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. So we've got some axes like this. If this is z, and this is x, and this is y, I can rotate z, rotate this so that z falls along x. Because this whole, and all these relationships are preserved under rotations, OK? So all these, all these relationships are preserved when I do a rotation. I can rotate z into x and y rotates correspondingly, and it works. So I can view this coordinate system from any frame I want just by doing a rotation in any direction. Does that concept I just made there make sense about the rotation? OK, good, because that's very important, because that's exactly what a Lorentz transformation is. It's a rotation, but it's not just a rotation in space. It's a rotation in time as well. So we have to imagine like another vector. Actually, I'm going to do it in the same color because I don't want you to really differentiate this. Now we have a T as well. And so we've got a four-dimensional space-time representing all of our coordinates. And this electron has all four of these. And if I change my, I can change frames of reference from like, say, my reference frame to the electron's reference frame. And changing that reference frame is the same thing as doing a rotation of this coordinate system. It's a rotation in space-time. That's what a Lorentz transformation does. And that's essentially what we've been doing when we've been finding these coordinate transformations that relate time in one frame of reference to time in another. We just didn't realize that's what we were doing geometrically. But that is what we're doing.